Welcome to the New Trust Economy, where your hosts, Blockchain 101 author and founder of Rise Housing, Monica Profit, and Inc. innovation columnist and brand casting strategist, Tracy Hazard, explore all things blockchain, ICO ventures, and cryptocurrency. Each week, they explore businesses, applications, and venture built on blockchain or cryptocurrency and address issues like women and diversity in tech, trust and distrust, and the economics of access and value. We would like to remind our listeners that investing in disruptive tech, ICOs, and cryptocurrency is speculative in nature and involves substantial risk of loss. We encourage you to invest carefully and do your due diligence first. Now, here are your hosts, Monica Profit and Tracy Hazard. Hey, Tracy Hazard here on the New Trust Economy, and I have a really interesting interview, an international one today. Um, so it's pretty late her time, pretty early mine, or not that early, but early enough. And so I have the CEO and co-founder of Hot Now, Niti Nan. Um, she's from Thailand, and she uh, is a serial entrepreneur with a successful career in video games. And she's also the co-founder of Axion Games, one of the leading AAA independent video game studios in China. Niti Dan oversaw record-breaking games such as Gears of War, one of the most successful Xbox games, Infinity Blade, the fastest selling iOS app in the history at launch, and Rising Fire selected as Ten Tencent's uh, headline shooting game for 2018. Why we're talking today, though, is that they had a hot token, had a ICO in 2017, and they have a retail play as well. So I thought that this was really interesting for us to have a conversation about how, what's going on between the combination of gaming and retail and how tokenization is playing a part of that. So, Niti Nan, welcome. Hi, Tracy. How are you doing? Good. So, you know, you have been playing in the gaming industry for, what did you say, like a dozen years? This is quite some time, right? 14 years? Uh, 13, 14 years or so. Yes. Yeah, so quite some time. And, you know, over here in the U.S., we have a lot of conversation about how there's not a lot of women involved in the gaming industry. <laughs> so you are quite an exception there. Not only are you very successful, but you're a woman playing in this field. So tell me how you got, a, got started in gaming and how you keep up on technology as you move forward in your career. So it was all a very um, analytical decision to try to get into gaming space. Um, I started off my career as a financial analyst and got myself involved into a uh, capital okay. market. Now I seriously <laughs> haven't heard that one from a single gaming company before. So financial <laughs> into game, no, okay, go on. <laughs> So, um, so as I was uh, uh, doing um, a lot of investing and, and trading, um, I, I kind of had the time to study a lot of uh, various industry across um, all things. And, and of all things, I started noticing that uh, gaming has zero correlation with how the market moves. But basically, it's resistance to market downturn. Right? Ah. So when the market went down, Revenue on our gaming side did not go down with it. So that's kind of caught my attention. And that's interesting. So now that goes, flies in the face of retail because retail always takes a hit. Yes, indeed it does. And so, um, so it was always in the back of my mind that I wanted to somehow get into um, you know, gaming space just because it's, that data alone was really interesting. And, and around the time during the year 2004, um, broadband is starting to get popular, get propagated in in Asia, where Korea and Japan was kind of you know the one that leading the pack. And as I went into looking um, into the usage of the internet package on on the broadband in in those days, I found that the number one usage for the broadband was to download porn. Oh, of and course it was, right? <laughs> I thought to myself, well, I can't really do porn, so what's the next thing? Yeah. And it turned out it, it was... Uh, so the number gaming. two was get online gaming. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, okay, this is something I really got to get into because I believe it was, it was going to be the next growth wave um, you know, in, in these regions. And so I was trying to identify the niche of how I would get into the, the space. And 
you know, being the, the finance, obviously, the first thing you're going to look at is cost structure. So <laughs> I dive into looking at the, the cost structure of video game productions. And it's turned out that the cost of producing game has been going up in an exponential uh, manner as the uh, computer, computer graphic and computer processing uh, all the chip was, you know, ha getting more powerful because a so, lot of the so computing power was going was getting faster and cheaper, and yet yep. production was going skyrocketing in price. That's an unusual situation. Well, because if the platform is getting better, what happened is gamer expect to see more because now that device is sophisticated and it can play a lot more better graphic, uh, ni nicer audio, and therefore the content that will be serving those platform, I expect it to look awesome. And the production that, you know, the cost of going to making things look awesome is very expensive. Well, and also, you know, there were games that were setting the bar at that time. Like we were just talking about this the other day because Game of Thrones season eight just have landed and everybody's, you know, gone through that. And they really set the bar on that level of TV requirement that is almost movie quality at TV, yep. you know, at TV prices, although they're kind of high priced for TV. I think it was $15 million an episode. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, looking at that, it's the same thing happened in the gaming industry. And it's happened in an even more expansive degree because if, if you're thinking about movie productions, you know exactly what you're going to be showing on the screen, right? So you only build stuff just for that limited space that the screen will cover. But in video games, you don't know how people are going to behave in your game, right? They could be running around here and there. So what you would do, you, you end up building the whole world. Right, uh, you have to build an entire world. <laughs> Exactly. So that's why the, the cost of video, video, video game just went crazy. And at the time, most of the uh, production studio that are able to produce high-end game are only located in, in the West, which we know that the labor cost is expensive if you compare to emerging country like in Asia. Right. Right. So, so let's fast forward a little bit. So your platform is called Hot Now. And is it a, it, it, do you produce your own games on that platform or is it more of like an app store? Like how does that work? So the, um, the eventual uh, revolution in the platform, you know, I, I, I see it to be sort of like an app store, but you know, maybe not, you know, of that large extent because most of the content that will be integrating on the platform obviously will just be focusing on on games you know not all uh, other not any apps, apps. That, yeah not okay. any app uh but so i'm it's a using game my, marketplace in a way yes and and i'm using my my own studios that you know i uh, have a, a few in various country um to produce the, the first set of content to be plug onto the platform, basically to set example of what can be done and how the game developers who's gonna be joining the platform can benefit out of this network. Interesting. Okay, so so you're so you're creating the you know the premium model. So this is what it looks like. This is what you should be creating. This is the level of quality we're studying. So now why ICO it? So because um, obviously you know ICO was basically an alternative means of startup to you know raise money to fund that, that project if, if you don't want to go the VC route or uh, you, you don't want to just go raise money from a few wealthy institution or private individuals you know ICO is, is a gateway uh, an, a good alternative for you know getting capital into the door to try to execute your project but another another reason is i think uh, the technology that underlying what we're trying to do uh, the blockchain itself made perfect sense because uh, this platform what it's doing is is basically trying to utilize uh, the space and the asset in the game itself so you you think of uh, the native ad that is seamlessly integrated within the game content itself. So it's like when you're playing a game, it's like you're living in another virtual world that someone built. And in that world, everything in the world, imagine if, if you can change it on a real-time basis into any commercial content that the brand or your, your vendor partner require it to be. So for example, you're running around in a house and on a table, there's a cat sitting, sitting on it. 
and one day that can might become a cold can or the next hour it could become a uh, mountain dew right so this is what the technology enable uh, the game content to do and when you're so, looking you know, at um, really interesting so i have some young kids who play a lot of games over time um young games you know and it always surprised me that um how long it sometimes took the um game developers to get products out there for the game, mm -hmm. right? And yep. so there is a lag behind because they don't know what's going to be popular. They don't know what kids are going to interact with. So they, they don't actually um, plan that out. And it isn't until later mm -hmm. that they realize that kids want this stuffed animal, which happened to be a secondary yep. character or something like that. And so, you know, it always has surprised me. So I actually had to multiple times with my daughters because they're such early adopters, actually had to sew animals that look like their their characters because we couldn't find them anywhere and so you know so that's interesting so you're going to pre-integrate that based on uh relationships with brands uh we don't even have to pre-integrate anything this content can be changed in real time and it will also be changed upon the target audience so they ah. take the technology that hot now has built enable you to do just that and the reason for it is um, I want to hook the two up because if you look at gaming this day, you can comfortably say that it's the largest form of entertainment media on earth right now. But if you look at the value of digital advertising that, that is being created within a gaming space, it's only represent about 1.4% of the total value of digital advertising, which is tiny. And it, it doesn't you know, go hand in hand with the size of the media itself. Yeah, that doesn't go hand in hand because when well, you know immersive media tends to have a higher should have should have literally a higher conversion rate. So we have, you know, on podcasting, for instance, uh, integrated mm -hmm. ads. So host recorded ads, we would have a 37% conversion rate on things that we suggest here. Yep. But yep. social media has a 1.3%, for example. Mm -hmm. So for it to have that low says that they were doing something wrong in the way in which they're serving ads. Mm -hmm. And so you've changed that. You've immersed yep. them. You've, you've created a much more um, uh, immersive environment for the advertisements themselves. Yeah, because some, something as immersive as gaming, you know, people are so into it that they're here to be interrupted, if you think about it. When you're playing game, what would you feel if there's just a pop-up ad that just pop right in front of your face, or a video that force you to watch you know, 30 seconds of content just because you can get some in-game currency, right? Yeah. The, the, in reality, people who click on those videos because they want that extra currency in the game, what they do is they click on the video, they put their phone down, and they wait 30 seconds before they pick it up again. They don't even really see those ads. <laughs> That's like, the time to go take a coffee break. and uh, exactly. <laughs> Right, exactly. Go get that Coca-Cola and come back, right? As, uh, so that's really interesting. Yeah, so you're, you're tapping into the behavior as well as what's in best service because you know it's not that they're not interested in it it's just that they're not they because of the disruptive nature they're not paying attention to it right and, and what we also added to uh, the whole value chain is the last mile uh, measurability because the the issue of digital advertising overall is um, the measurability of the actual purchase itself so when you do an advertising on a digital platform yeah, you, you can count like how many people, how many eyeballs see your ads, or you can even count a click, like how many people actually went on and click on, you know, those ad content. But at the end of the day, you don't really know how many actually convert into purchases. So what the platform does is we integrate a digital coupon within those in-game assets itself. So the, the journey of the customer is the gamer can interact with those objects or, or, or the commercial content within the game and it could pop up to become a reward coupon that go right st straight into the, you know, the Hot Now app uh, coupon wallet where the user so they don't can have take- to remember anything, they just get nope. to keep it. So it is, it, is this a token? The token now act as an access granting key to all these services and to unlock all these benefits. So that how the Hot Now ecosystem work, I'm trying to create something that all the participants that doing something doing some activity on this network can benefit from it right 
I want it to function like an actual real world economy. So I'm, I'm looking at it as I'm trying to create a new country with its own currency and it should have a functional economy that drive the value of the currency itself. And so here's your exactly finance background coming right back in. I love that because that's interesting <laughs> because too often it's, you know, it, it's, there's, there's a, it, it feels like manipulated currency within a game, right? That's, you know, I'm earning points, I'm earning coin, I'm earning whatever that mm -hmm. is and it's purchasable, you know, and I can purchase, but only within the catalog of items that they've chosen there. And so right. it's, it, you know, it's not as, uh, it doesn't extend external, but in this case, through being able to earn the rights to and have the ability for yeah. the digital coupons, you're now mm -hmm. allowing them to step outside as well. Yeah, by allowing them to step outside and mark the value of currency with the real world item, basically what, what we're doing here is you automatically install the intrinsic value into your currency right away. Right, so that, that's the first benchmark that I'm trying to create arbitrary. value. Yeah, I'm trying to create value to the token holder. Obviously, you know, people who have entrusted that capital with us, we want to make sure that we also return uh, real value back to them. And the way that um, I try to make this platform function is, is I just go back to the principle of the real economy that, you know, how, how the currency or, or our hot token should be released into the whole network should be driven purely by the real demand of the currency itself. So the rate of release of the token that's going to the economy basically uh, grow with the actual um, economic activity that all the participant is performing in the network. And how the value of the currency will be justified in this network is basically go, um, has a positive correlations with the size of the economy itself, which determined by the velocity of the money being a change in, in this economy that is actually being spent on the real economic activities, not just, you know, being traded on some crypto exchange somewhere. Right. So you're encouraging them to share in a way, which is very common in the retail world. So in other words, I just got a coupon here. You, you got to go there, right? So they're encouraging yeah. that, that activity to have other people mm -hmm. access that as well. And there's, and there's a financial reward for the whole community for that. Yeah. So like that's kind of the relationship directly between the brand, the vendor and the consumer themselves. But I also want to create an environment where the consumer can interact with one another and exchange this coupon that they pick up through playing games. So I also create a marketplace uh, within this network itself that people can exchange coupon they found in the game. Like, and they, they can trade it and they can Between literally create it. Ah, I see. So I don't, really, like, I don't really drink doing it. Yeah, I don't really drink Mountain Dew, but I'm willing to trade this for you for Starbucks or whatever that might be. <laughs> Oh, you, you can trade it for, for the, the currency in it, the hot token on network itself, right? And you're holding hot token. And later on, if you run into someone that want to sell the coupon that you want, you can then spend this hot token that you just earn selling some coupon that you don't want and yeah. then buy the other coupon. I love it. So you, so you, it encourages you to pick up what you find no matter what, because it may be valuable to somebody else. I love that. So you talk about the right product, the right time, and right channel as being your focus for... Um, the curation of the customer experience. And, you know, I like that because we talk, I talk about, I have another podcast called Product Launch Hazards, um, and we're specifically focusing on retail products. And, mm -hmm. um, and we say, I say something very, very similar, that it has to be the right thing at the right time with the right resources. And so, yeah. you know, otherwise it, it won't sing, it won't fly at retail because retail is all about um, timing in a sense is, is this the right time? Is this the right product for this market? And mm -hmm. that mar product market fit is more, um, essential to any other thing that you might do. You can't spend, if it's a wrong fit, you can't spend enough ad dollars to correct that. Um, mm -hmm. And I always say, if you don't have the right market, you can't, you know, you're going to spend a fortune trying to tell that market and educate them on the product. Right. It's not a fit. So, so you've got, you've tapped into a way in which you can almost flexibly do this. So you can yep. test out products and say, are these flying with my community or not? Mm -hmm. Well, and, and not only that, and you, you can uh, make it a full circle, right? Because 
you can make people do activity in the real world and circle them back into the game as well. Because some people are playing game because they feel like they're escaping the real world and, and they want to make a statement of their own identity in another version of themselves in, in another world. Right? So that would be something that um, you know, they, they want to uh, express through video game by being better than anyone else in the gaming world. Right, so they might find certain item in the gaming world valuable to them more than something in the real world. So the merchant in the, in the real world can also uh, benefit from this psychology where they don't always have to, you know, give constant discount because, you know, in reality, uh, businesses do not want to sell stuff at discount. So right. you can choose to benefit the con consumer another way by saying stuff like, Guess what? If you spend up to $30 at my shop, you can gain this token that then you can spend and gain access to the in-game item that you want. So it can flip the models the other way as well. Interesting. So, you know, that that's so, uh, you know, I was thinking before about, so you've really created a very, very big challenge for you and your company because not only are you building games that have to have a very high quality level because the bar is set really high as an industry in general, mm -hmm. but you've got to, you've got to create a, a ad platform for, and I'm struggling with this too on my advertising platform that belongs with my, I have a, I have a, it's not blockchain based yet. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm working on that being blockchain based, but an advertising portal basically that advertises on all of the podcasts that we produce and we produce over 200 right now. And mm -hmm. so, um, and the challenge that we faced is similar to the challenge you're facing, which is advertisers. Uh, first off, I think advertising in gaming is underserved. Like in other words, most advertisers are not taking advantage of it, possibly because of the low conversion rate. Also, the lack of measurability that's existed prior to now. So it hasn't been as viable or as, I'm going to say, mainstream an advertising mm -hmm. option. Um, and podcasts have been very similar. We have a very bad measurability. Um, there's mm -hmm. really, it's really hard to measure the success rate. So that's a challenge. So now you have to build up ad, an, a whole ad group, an ad platform at, one, at the same time that you're building up assets and, and wonderful games to have them be on. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, that's quite a challenge. So you must be building quite a big corporation. So how did you, um, so what did your, how did your ICO go and what did you raise? Um, it, it went um, successfully. Uh, we managed to raise $37 million. Wow. And obviously the, the game business has, has, has been running and I was, you know, more than ready to uh, plug everything, all the resources that we already had. Uh, into trying to bring this vision in, into a reality. And I'm happy to also share with you that pretty much all the pieces is now done and I'm in a testing process right now. And the yeah. first pilot of all this actually will go out in July. In July, so you're really close. Wow, wonderful. So what's been your biggest challenge um, or what is your biggest challenge going forward? Um, I would say the uh, the the... <laughs> The crypto environment in general, uh, because uh, the regulatory that is still murky in some territories, and uh, a lot of big companies are still in loss of how they want to treat digital asset on their book, uh, as well as you know some some of the country basically just outright ban crypto. <laughs> but right. I'm lucky. I'm lucky in a sense that Thailand is not one of them. <laughs> well, but you know, it's not, it's not even really crypto because you're not, I mean, the exchange market is within it. And how have we not had that? I mean, that's existed in the gaming community. I can remember playing, you know, you could play arcade games and it was token based. So, yeah. you know, there was always that a level of acceptance in that community already and no regulations happened as long as it stayed within that. So it, it's the slight, slight step outside to exchanging that for goods that mm -hmm. is only the slight mark. And, you know, the reality is, is that any retailer has an option to take a coupon or take a, you know, That's, right? So take a gift yeah. certificate, right? So why is that any different? It shouldn't be. Um, but it, it shouldn't be. But, you know, you know, it, it is because a lot of the governments and, you know, valid points that they should be scared that when they start, you know, in, enable people to have control over their own currency, <laughs> then, you know, the, 
the, the central governments or the central banks become less influential of how they can control um, monetary system. Right. Because it, like, and it's a valid point, but you know, if, if you look at the, the upside of, of, of what blockchain and this whole potential can, can provide, I would think that the benefits uh, supersede the potential downside. And it, it might just all be about uh, Im- imaginary scare anyway, in, in any case, because I would you know, for, for, for a country to, to form a currency that has been stable until this day, especially you know, a country like the US, um, it got to the point where you don't even need intrinsic value to believe in the dollars anymore. It's right. all percep- perceptive value that people just trust in the value of the US dollar. And that's all it is. And that trust is never gonna gonna go away as long as uh, the government mm. itself. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I know, really. So, you know, this is this has been so interesting. Um, I'm so glad you came on to, to talk about these uh, what's going on over there so so you're coming out of uh, you're coming out of testing and and moving into being available are you doing a limited um op- offering so in other words could people from the u.s access the platform in july or is it only within uh thailand uh we look at thailand as our first market and you know if, if you've been in any tech development at all you always always expect something to go wrong Absolutely. <laughs> right. <laughs> so so we, we take a cautious step in, in having, you know, um, limited access just in Thailand for the probably the first few months. And once we know that everything is all smooth, all stable, then we start opening up access to the rest of the world. Right. Wonderful. Well, is there anything else you want me to know and, or you want our audience here at New Trust Economy to know? Well, I... What I believe is, um, I think I'm trying to create something of, of real value that have uh, real world um, efficacy. And as well as, you know, I, I don't want people to look at this being a speculative investment on, on the blockchain space. What I'm trying to utilize is the infrastructure on the blockchain itself is just to add, you know, transparency and as a vehicle to transfer value and just to provide trust, you know, on the exchange of of the currency on this network itself and the the token it, it will function as basically just a mean to unlock all the services that us as as a platform is providing as well as the merchant partner and all other platforms that want to plug into our utility network um the one thing that i forgot to mention is uh, even though I said that I don't mean to be like a Google app store that I'm going to have like a gazillion cons- app on it, but for those um, other applications that um, has an adjacent uh, prospect, you know, with the content business, gaming uh, and, and retail space, are uh, more than welcome um, to, to join the Hot Now Network and utilize what we have already built in terms of um, the securities of the blockchain network itself. And I have also uh, created a usage workflow that enable um, autom- automatic um, tax system and escrow system where, you know, developer can just take like a couple of weeks to plug in their platform and it's all good to go versus, you know, trying to build all this usage workflow by yourself, even if you're trying to build it on top of existing um, blockchain infrastructure like Stellar or Ethereum, it's going to be like four or five month developments, uh, even with uh, an experienced team of blockchain coder. So I have made it super easy, open API for, for anyone to plug in a couple of weeks, good to go. So you're, so you're really creating an ability for existing game developers to integrate with your system, work in that process and... Oh, wow. I mean, that, that's really impressive. Yeah. Will they also be able to, I mean, cause you mentioned early on that, you know, that there's a, a significant labor cost difference. Um, mm-hmm. So will yep. they be able to, I'm going to call it subcontract then with your team of developers as well? That's, that's always a potential because I'm, I'm, I'm quite selective because even though I have quite a few hundred developers in house, um, it, it's still um, a limited capacity because I, I can't take on every project. But if uh, the project has a very interesting concept, you know, by, by all means, you know, send us some, some details. I'll be happy to, to take a look um, on all those type of things. And one thing that I want to stress with, with the uh, game developer community 
is, um, and you may know or you may not know that if you notice the business model in gaming business these days is what we call the freemium models. It's the most popular models where you download game for free and people doing in-game uh, purchase. Yeah. But in reality is if, if you dig into that business models, on average, only about 5% of the people who play the game end up buying anything in the game at all. So yeah. what's happening is game developer, you are not um, monetizing uh, out of those 95% of the player that playing your game every day. So this, this, you know, by just plugging in your game onto a platform like this and making your real estate in the game, in the virtual world, become something that you can monetize, basically now you, you get a chance of creating another stream of revenue from the 95% of the player that you can never get a grip on for. That's right. That's right. And you know what? That's so essential because so much money is spent in the initial just to get to that freemium model of business that, you know, it's, it's not viable. It's why they, why they go belly up all the time because they don't realize yeah, what they're it, getting it, into, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, because of that model, so the nature of it, it's kind of become winner takes all type of, of business. So 85% of the game out there are not profitable only uh the 15 percent that's considered a hit is making any money through in-app purchase yeah. so now so, the 85 percent of, of those game you don't have to worry about uh transacting selling in-game any in-game item anymore as long as there's still people playing your games here's another re revenue stream for you Absolutely. Well, Nitinan, thank you so much. Um, hot now. You guys be looking for this out there. It's, it's starting in the um, Thailand platform right now um, or in a couple of months. And then it will be hopefully worldwide shortly after that. So thank you so much. Keep us posted on how things are going. Thank you, Tracy. This Have has a been good morning. Thank you. <laughs> this has been Tracy Hazard on the New Trust Economy, and I'll be back again with a new episode shortly. You've been listening to The New Trust Economy. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Visit us online at newtrusteconomy.com or on social at newtrusteconomy. Thanks for exploring The New Trust Economy with us.